<laughs> it's for Rebecca. Thank you all so much, and on behalf of Rebecca, I thank you as well, because <laughs> I have to do that. Um, it's great to be here with all of you, and um, we have so many things to talk about, <laughs> so many things. We're, we're going to get to, I hope, all of them, and, um, and we're going to take some of your questions, as you well know. But um, I want to start by just uh, saying that, as someone who's been a, in this game for a long time, I, I couldn't help wondering if Rebecca Traster simply has the most extraordinary timing in the history of feminism, <laughs> or whether, in fact, she's the one that turned the tide. I mean, we've all been angry for a very long time. Um, and what Rebecca has done is make us, help us understand that anger is, in fact, the language of feminism. Uh, that is, of course, a compliment. <laughs> Uh, this is a book of many insights and of great hope um, because for the first time, Rebecca's made anger not only acceptable, but critically necessary. So Rebecca, I want to say thank you very oh, much. That's lovely. Thank and, you. and let's start with, with kind, of a, kind of a definition. You've been running all over the country and all over the media, and I know that um, all of you have been following a lot of that, but you write in your introduction, and I quote, I value my own rage and the rage of others, unquote. This is not how women were used to describing their outlook on life. No, it's not how I described it prior to like two years ago. So is, is anger now the default position of strong women? No, I, but I think what needs to happen, and, it, and it's, the book isn't meant to be just an outright celebration of anger in all its forms, right? It's, part of it is an examination of how anger, especially um, with regard to power and power structures work. And, and part of it is corrective to all of these messages that, that women and lots of vulnerable people, lots of people who have lacked power within our world, have, we've been just drowning in these messages that our anger is invalid, um, that it will undermine us if we express it, that it will, it, it, we won't be able to use it as a weapon on our behalf, rather it will, it will lead us to be taken less seriously, that our anger makes us seem infantile. Women of color are raised being taught that their anger will, will render them threatening and militant. So instead of being, a, a, there are lots of things, lots of negative qualities about anger that are, that are very real. But what this book is trying to do is, is situate anger at inequality and anger at injustice, which lots of women have been trained to hide. Lots of women's anger on these topics has been censured. And um, it, it's an attempt to reclaim that anger, to show how it's been politically consequential, propellant to many of the social and political movements that have transformed this nation and its laws. Um, so, and, and yeah, yes, it is corrective to all those messages that, that tell us over and over again from the time that we are born not to value our own anger, not to express our own anger as if it is not a, a part of the range of human expression and a valid reaction to all kinds of inequities and injustice that we should keep it bottled in, that we should feel ashamed or or alone or weird if we feel it. Um, it is trying to correct a lot of those messages and acknowledge the role that it's played in political change. Okay, talking about that correction, um, <clears throat> course correction, if you will, uh, you and I are about a generation apart, and I'm from the crowd in the 60s and 70s that were told when we got angry how cute we were mm -hmm. when we were angry. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were also told uh, by our moms and by everybody else that anger wasn't going to do it for us. Mm -hmm. What changed the equation? Well, I think it's still being changed. I don't know that. So I would say that looking back historically, it's not a question of anger. Anger has done things within social movements, right? The anger has been there. The question is how we frame it, and that framing is still changing. I talk on this book tour, I've gone and, and spoken in front of audiences where people have come up to me afterwards every single night crying, saying, 
a version of I am always telling my sister that she's too angry and now like now I'm just beginning to rethink that she really had something to be angry about. Um, I live my life being embarrassed because my mother was angry all the time and now I'm thinking that she was actually angry like on the right side of history. <laughs> so it's not a question of anger was once bad and now we're understanding it to be good. I think that my book, along with a lot of others, Soraya Chamali's Rage Becomes Her, that was published a few weeks before mine, Brittany Cooper's magnificent, magnificent book, Eloquent Rage, about black feminist rage as a superpower. Um, these are, we're having conversations now that are trying to correct some of these aspersions, but it's not like now anger's good. Look at Christine Blasey Ford. It's not as though you know, you had a Senate Judiciary Committee that was like ready to hear her go in guns blazing about how much she liked beer. Like there is, and yet, <laughs> right, we can't imagine that, right? You know, this is, this is, she would have been arrested. I mean, there's, if she had turned those questions, if she had behaved in terms of tone or approach in any way that resembled the way that Kavanaugh behaved later that afternoon, she would have been, we can't, we can't even imagine, she would have been everything that our mothers told us. Right. She would have not right. been, they're not wrong. That's the thing, those messages. Ruth Bader Ginsburg in the documentary about her talks about how she was always careful not to use anger in a courtroom because it would work against her. Anger would have worked against Christine Blasey Ford. Uh, if you're a woman in office who has every reason to be angry at your boss for some form of mistreatment or you're not paid as much and you have every righteous reason to be angry, if you express that anger, if you yell, there's a very good chance that in fact, you will then gain a reputation as but, difficult. But at least we're talking about oh, it. We're talking about it, and right. And you could and not have written, I, I mean, it's probably true about a, a million things, but you could not have written your book a generation ago. It would right. not have been acceptable. It would not have been, it wouldn't have sold anything. I'm not sure I could have written this book five years ago. There have been people throughout who have been, you know, Audre Lorde was writing about the value of right. anger in the 1980s and she was making a huge impression. Obviously her intellectual and political legacy is long, but I don't want to claim that that my book or Britney's or Soraya's is somehow discovered this. There have been a lot of people talking about anger um, and its value within political movements. There are a lot of people being openly angry for a long time. But it's there so is a mass, this is a moment, right. and in part right. we have to acknowledge some of the racial and class dynamics of it. This particular period, these two years, um, this is a moment in which anger has bubbled over in the wake of the 2016 election and part of who it's bubbled over into is white middle class women. Right. And we see an echo of things that have happened in the past with the second wave women's movement. The, uh, Sadie Alexander, an uh, African American lawyer, was making arguments about the value of paid work outside the home for black families and for, and for black women's lives in the, in the 1930s. And when Betty Friedan made similar arguments, However many years later, it, uh, Betty Friedan directing her arguments toward a white middle class um, and at a moment when white middle class women were feeling that problem that had no name, um, because the audience was a white middle class audience that was you know, exploding into anger, that's, Betty Friedan winds up getting credited with certain things. Right. I am not comparing myself to Betty Friedan, I really <laughs> want to be clear, but I do think that the mass the mass rage that is experienced in being expressed politically and in terms of activism by a, by a white middle class is bringing to popular conversation right. some of this. Uh, l let me do a little bit more history. Yeah. Um, you write in your book about the 1972 Democratic Convention, um, which was, um, for those of you who remember the moment, uh, in Miami, a um, a crazy time. I was there as an extremely young reporter, three o'clock in the morning, when women felt the double cross from the McGovern troops. I don't know how much of you this uh, any of you remember or know about, but there were issues going on. There were the Gary Hart troops on the other, and there was a real feeling of betrayal on the issue of abortion rights, which women were really furious about. Here's the thing I want to mention. I remember distinctly, and I've written about this. CBS News analyst anchor Eric Severide, remember him? Mm. Very oh. distinguished anchor, okay. Oh, I know what you're gonna say. <laughs> Eric Severide, I was standing on the floor of the convention and I saw this and heard this. So I went on the air on national television and said, what are the ladies angry about? 
That was the sentence. He then went on on the issue of equal representation because these were the days when the issue was if you're going to have, we first started getting women involved in committees and in caucuses and everything else. And Eric Severide said, if you're going to carry it all the way, who's going to represent the left handed Lithuanians? This was in the idea of diversification. So a Massachusetts delegate later said to me, what happened with South Carolina and the abortion issue? This kind of garbage is never going to happen again. Well, of course it did. Oh, it yeah. kept on happening and it kept on happening. Mm -hmm. why, why did women's anger then not break through when it seems to be breaking through a little bit more now? Well, I think it, it happens in cycles. There were, women's anger did break through during the second wave. It had anger at um, sexual harassment, which then didn't have a name in the mid-70s. Right. Um, and there were a lot of lawsuits filed by, um, in many cases, women of color taking from civil rights law ideas about equal treatment under the law and filing lawsuits, Michelle Vincent and, and Paulette Barnes. <coughs> I'm sorry. A woman named Carmita Wood at, at Cornell, that wound up changing the law, working its way up right. through the courts. And in 1986, sexual harassment was barred under Title VII of the, of the Civil Rights Act um, by the Supreme Court. Um, you know, the, the laws around hiring and discrimination changed. There were the anger, and it was, there was an anger that did break through as far as a, a social movement and the women's movement, you know, in following and in concert with a civil rights movement, a gay rights movement. Um, and, it, and it made extensive changes and it had a huge disruptive impact on the country. And it had an impact not only on its laws, but it was disruptive to personal relationships. Mm -hmm. Marriages broke up, there was, a there was a spike in the divorce rates. Things, the structure was left imbalanced. Women's the anger of the less powerful at the power structure shakes up that power structure in ways that create a kind of chaos. And part of the reaction to that, and you see it, I mean, the big symbolic moment is when another kind of politicized anger, the anger of right wing, usually white women, embodied in this case by Phyllis Schlafly, leading an army of angry conservative women on behalf of white patriarchal power in this country in a successful campaign to stop the ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment. And then, and this happens coterminously with the election of Ronald Reagan. And that ushers in an era of backlash in which all that anger that was exposed and that made everything chaotic and changed things and made people uncomfortable and altered family structure and attitudes and changed the rules about who got to work and who got to get paid and, and how we were gonna think about gender equality and sex, all those things. Birth control had been made legal. You know, there's a, all kinds of things had changed. There'd been a sexual revolution and, and things had been up in the air and then the ba anti-feminist backlash settled in in the Reagan years and what happens is what often happens is that all that discomfort and chaos was papered over. You know, Susan Faludi's backlash tracks so much of this. The message is being sent within the media, from politics, um, in, you know, the, the political coverage, the pop culture, all covering, papering over. And out of that, you get a caricature of those angry women of the 1970s, where... But you're saying, I never thought of Phyllis Schlafly as angry. I thought we were the angry oh, ones. Oh, Phyllis Schlafly, was angry. oh no, anger on, yes, but anger works, look, there are a lot of women who are angry at the right wing right now and who have dedicated their lives to activism, to running for office, to going to protest, to striking, being parts of the teacher strikes and the fast food worker strikes. There's also obviously anger coming from the right. That's the Donald Trump space. Right. And that's anger on behalf of an old system, a system built on white patriarchy. And that, that anger, the anger at the perception that their power has been diminished is really powerful. That anger is part of what gets Donald Trump into the White House. And, and that leads into, you talked about Brittany Cooper and her book, Eloquent Rage, and, and black women, and word I truly hate, but it has some meaning, intersectionalism. Let's talk about to what extent has our, dare I say it, relatively new, finally, consciousness of being more inclusive, has that made some of this happen? Ooh. Is black rage a big part of this? Oh, well, yes. Um, I mean, I think it's, I think that one of the crucial things that's happening in this iteration is that we are having a conversation and trying to do better than we have done in earlier eras. Right. 
that does not mean that white women are like acing the test. <laughs> um, and there's no better example of that than if you look at the Women's March. Mm -hmm. And so. Because? Because you have, first of all, the longtime base of the Democratic Party, black women. The long time throughout sort of every social, practically every social movement, some of the, the path breakers, the groundbreaking thinkers, black women who's, who do the works. I mentioned Sadie Alexander, Polly Murray, the lawyer who, whose work on gender and racial discrimination was so important that she wound up being credited later by both Thurgood Marshall and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, mm -hmm. a black man, a white woman who had more power than the black woman who did the thinking for how groundbreaking that work was, right? You have black women doing the revolutionary thinking, but without the power, in fact, shut out within, a, and this is something Brittany Cooper has, has taught me over and over again about the structure of how white patriarchy works. It extends certain kinds of power and benefit in two directions, patriarchy to men across races, and white supremacy to white women. Black women are so far away from that power source and not you know, offered power within it. They're doing this revolutionary work. They're doing the groundbreaking thinking. And then the people who have more power, white women, black men, come into those movements that they've laid the groundwork for and often co-opt the work that they've done or appropriate it or, or remake it in their issue and, and in, their, in their image. So, and that history has happened over and over again. So in the wake of the 2016 election, when 90, 4% of black women vote for Hillary Clinton over Donald Trump. And according to exit polls, the data is slightly more complicated, but the big picture is right. according to exit polls, 53% of white women okay. vote, vote for, for Donald Trump. Trump. Did I say? 53. I said it wrong. I said it wrong with the 94% of black women voted for no, Hillary no. Clinton. Okay. 53% um, of white women. Right. The night of the election, two white women think of we're going to have an angry march. And then in the initial planning stages of it, decide to call the march the Million Women's March, which was the name of a, or, of a black women's right. march years earlier. That is a perfect example of exactly what has happened over and over again historically. And yet, here's the good part about what happened. And there was anger, and people were angry about it, and they fought about it, and Audre Lorde has said, in her, this, the essay that she wrote in the early 80s for an academic conference, The Uses of Anger, where she argues that anger between allies, and she's writing especially about anger over racism within a women's movement, anger between, uh, anger of black women at white women over racism within right. a women's movement, is we must express it that expressing it, anger between allies is generative. It gets us to the next place. I Suppressing agree. it yeah. doesn't do anything. So people have the fight in the planning of the Women's March. And in fact, other women come in from uh, women come in from other movements. A multiracial group of organizers come in from other movements, and they make it a, a march that is about all kinds of feminist concerns, not just you know about um, criminal justice reform or and, sexual harassment. And se yes, and and it f and Linda Sarser, one of the organizers of the march, says contentious dialogue is by design. And that is part of the argument. We got to have these fights. We got to expose the but inequities that are replicated. And so that's part of the attempt to do it better. And then it winds up being the, the single biggest one day political right. protest of our time. The fights have not gone away. They continue to happen because inequity is replicated in all progressive coalitions. It's not exclusive to the women's movement, the civil rights movement, the environmental movement, certainly the new left. Um, all of the movements that have made the country better in part because they have been fighting against certain kinds of inequities have contained within them their own inequities. And the argument is, do we, oh, is it too divisive to talk about that? Is it gonna be destructive? Or as I believe in the spirit and you know, taking the lead of, of Audre Lorde decades before, I think the way to get better is to have the fights, even this, though they're painful. I think this is the basis of the Democratic Party. I, I hope whole, so. I mean, the Democratic Party has always been uh, fighting within <laughs> itself right. all the time. Well, one of the I'm not suggesting there's, this is a, a, a moment for sainthood <laughs> for anybody in the party, right. but um, <laughs> it is certainly, I, I remember when I first started covering politics and I, I, I knew almost nothing, and one of my colleagues at the AP who knew a lot of things said, you gotta understand that the, the Republicans, one person for a committee, one vote. The Democrats, you get a quarter of a vote, 
and an eighth of a vote mm. and a quarter. They just, they wanted everybody to have a piece of the action, but everybody was fighting each other all the time. But I actually kind of have come to, in recent years, a little bit of my own structural idea about why that is, what the difference, because everybody always talks about the Republican Party is great at messaging, they're great at controlling their message, they're great at doing all the Democrats are always in disarray. But one of the things that I've been thinking about and writing about is the way that our country is really constructed around minority rule. And I write this in the book, and I write it with regard to our founding. And our country was built on white patriarchy. It was built by white male founders. Its right. courts, its institutions, its economy um, was built around the power of a, a minority of the population with African Americans enslaved and not even granted full humanity, women not granted the franchise or rights, and that persisted obviously for a very long time. Um, and one of the fast, and now it's sort of being replicated in a partisan sense in that actually the Republican Party is a counter-majoritarian ruling party at this point. Donald Trump is the president, though he didn't win a majority of votes. The number of senators, you know, the, the, the number of Democratic senators are supported by millions of more Americans than the, than the Republican senators, but the Republicans have the majority. Right. Um, and in part, this goes, the Republican Party at this point is representing the interests of a white patri patriarchy and the Democratic Party has to represent the, the interests of the majority, the subjugated and oppressed majority. Well, that's a lot of different people. <laughs> so the right has to, has to reach, its messaging can be simpler and more direct and more effective because it's really got to reach a very, the, the minority power. Yeah, it's a minority, yes. But in order to, to sort of represent and channel and speak for and advocate for a fundamentally subjugated majority, you're dealing with all kinds of contentious, like you have to represent so many more people and their very diverse needs. And it's a structural reality for those parties. Is anger something that, um, well, we all know anger can be harmful to you if it, if it takes over your soul, if it takes over your life. Mm -hmm. um, in your conversations with, um, I know you talk to a lot of people for this book, psychiatrists, psychoanalysts, um, what is your sense from them on what anger does to the body and to the mind? Well, I, t you know, I talked less, I did less of the psychology stuff. Mine was, I, I, Soraya Shmali's book, Rage Becomes Her, is much better on the psychology than mine. Mine is really about anger in a political context, but I do do some writing about the effects on the body because I had absorbed, like many people, even when I wrote the introduction for my book, um, and I wrote this book very quickly, you know, I wrote, of course, you know, even while I'm trying to reclaim the political value of rage, of course it's bad for you. It corrodes. My dentist told me while I was writing the book <laughs> that, uh, oh, he said, oh, all my women patients are angry. And I said, oh, really? I was so, I, I took this as a good sign. And he said, yes, it's so sad. They grind their teeth. <laughs> and um, I've, you know, I've read all this coverage, stress and high blood pressure, and it's all very plausible to me. I'd like to suggest that was knowing laughter. Right. <laughs> right. Um, and, uh, and I, of course, right, we know to be angry, but, but part of what I came to think, and this was, I, I, I am anxious about saying this out loud because it's always taken as self-help, and I do not mean it as self-help because there is real censure and punishment for women who express their anger, and I'm in an extremely unique position. I was being paid, literally paid, to write a book about my anger and to take the anger of other women seriously. I was like in an anger biodome, right? Nothing bad was going to happen to me. I was being <laughs> rewarded for being angry. But in the four months that I wrote this book, I actually, like, I, f I was under enormous stress and I was horrified by what was happening at the world and I had all kinds of reasons to be anxious, but in fact, my physical health was sort of never better. Truly, <laughs> truly, and I didn't go in thinking about this at all. I only realized after the four months I was writing it and I went back to revise the introduction and I saw that sentence I'd written that said, of course, anger's bad for you physically. And I was like, wait a minute. Like, I have been sleeping more soundly, <laughs> wanting to exercise more than I have ever exercised in my life. Like, not because I was trying to exercise, just because I wanted to get outside and move. Like, what? That was not, I'm not, I've never been that person. I was eating well, my relationships were good, my, my, um, and I was like, wait a minute, I don't actually know that. And I've been like sort of, you know, not only taking my own anger seriously, but taking the anger of other women seriously. That's been my job every day for four months. And I have never felt better. And, and I began to think about the fact that part of what happens to all of us, and there's a lot of writing in the book, so many women talking about swallowing their anger, knowing they can't express it because it's going to 
undermine their point, knowing that they'll be heard as hysterical or infantile if they yell, or, or that it'll risk their job, and women of color talking about how if, if they express anger, even for the most righteous reason, they risk being jailed or shot. You know, the, the risks out there for expressing anger are so real, and so what do we all do? We bottle it up, we swallow it down, we keep it inside. Well, I think that might make us grind our teeth. I would say. And I think that, <laughs> and again, this is not. And by the way, can we just throw Michelle Obama in here who, yeah. who got accused of being famously an angry black woman? Yes, she did for expressing the mildest of critiques. Right. Lots of women said to me while doing interviews for this book, black women talked all the time about how they're presumed to be angry when they walk in a room, whether or not they've opened their mouths. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the ways that anger is used to fetishize, vilify, make into cartoons, mm -hmm. women. It's different depending on whether you're black or white or rich or poor, um, but there are all of these different ways in which, in which anger is used to disqualify you as fully human, when the fully human thing to do, by the way, is to feel anger as part of the range of human emotions, like joy and fear and, and sadness. Of course we all feel angry. What's the difference in our culture <laughs> about the way we see angry men and the way we see angry women. Uh-huh. <laughs> I like beer! <laughs> it gets you a spot on the Supreme Court. <laughs> um, well, here's the political <laughs> anger that we, um, you know, that, that is like our national lullaby, is the anger of the founders, right? They threw tea in a harbor. Yeah. Can you imagine if women did that? <laughs> um, women actually did later in North Carolina. Right. Um, <laughs> you don't hear about it as much. Um, but there is a monument to it. But there is a monument to it. <laughs> um, you know, the, the, our revolution, and I actually, part of what I argue in the book, is that one of the reasons that women's political anger is discouraged is because we have it in our DNA how consequential it can be when you get angry at inequity. Because what those founders were angry at was taxation without representation. They were angry at the fact that a government was policing them and taxing them and profiting from them without rep having them represented in government. And they were so angry about it, give me liberty or give me death, live free or die, throw the tea in the harbor. It was correctly, it is correctly, it, is, it was the revolution, it was a war, it was a break with, the, with another country and the formation of a new country. Mm -hmm. And that was anger at, at injustice. Mm -hmm. And it made a new country. And what did those founders do in making their new country? First of all, they built it out of the genocide of a native population. And they immediately set, up, set about codifying its institutions on the labor of populations who would be unrepresented in its government and would not have a chance at civic participation, who were enslaved, who were denied rights, protections, so men's and anger, franchise. So men's anger got rewarded? They rewarded themselves. Okay, fine. <laughs> I mean, they, they rewarded, yes, it got rewarded. It was, it's consequential, and we understand it. Who, when we think about voters in this country uh, who are angry and who a political press and political parties understand we have to take seriously, it's the guys in diners, right? There are 30 stories in the newspaper every week about guys in diners. That's not wrong. I want to be really clear. Those, the white guys in diners, what they're angry about, we should be paying attention to. There's an opioid addiction, job loss, technology changing, low wages, lack of access to health care. But imagine if we took everybody else's, and, but those, we're, we understand that anger because the, the press tells us every day it treats it as diagnostic and instructive and it points us to the things we need to fix and we should fix those things. Mm -hmm. But imagine if everybody else's anger was treated in that same way. Imagine if the anger that undergirds the movement for black lives, instead of being written about as disruptive mobs, thugs, Meghan McCain has called them a hate group, right? Imagine if being, and, and that is a movement consciously led, founded by black women in response to state violence against African Americans. Imagine if the coverage said, well, what the political candidate really didn't do was take Black Lives Matter activists seriously enough. No, what we're told on the left, I'm on the left, that when Black Lives Ma Matter activists interrupted Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton during their campaigns, that they were creating problems for those candidates. They were problematic because they were disturbing the events.
well, they were creating chaos. Or taking, or taking the anger over climate change seriously. Exactly. All of, yes. Which is seen as a left issue, which is an issue that, of course, affects us all deeply. Right. Yeah. Right. So, you know, this is the, I think we, the Brett Kavanaugh, the, the white working class voters and the diners, the founders, like there are all kinds of models around us for how, and, and I think in part it's because white men as still are first imagined and still normative citizens, right? Politically and also in our literature, right? Our heroes, the people we can imagine as fully human. The people who are presented to us constantly as fully human in ways that other kinds of people aren't sort of permitted to be, they're also presumed to be rational, right? Just because they're white men. White men are presumed to, to start from a point of rationality. And other people are not. <laughs> and women are presumed to start from a point of over-emotionality and irrationality. Hysteria. Hysteria. So when women get angry, it just confirms their hysteria and distances them further from the possibility of being taken seriously as, as politically rational thinkers. But men are granted an assumption, the presumption of rationality, and so when they get mad like Brett Kavanaugh, who by the way threw a temper tantrum, <laughs> but that anger can be coded. And, and I think it's important, by the way, that some people did see that, right? The powerful men he was getting angry for they understood that anger to undergird a rationality and a righteousness, right? It amplified the seriousness of his point. And anger in powerful white men is often taken for strength, leadership, passion, right? Because they're presumed that whatever they're angry about, they're, they're certainly rationally invested in. Well, look at the founding fathers. Exactly. <laughs> but I think it does matter. It does matter that a majority of Americans did not believe Brett Kavanaugh. Mm -hmm. Like, that matters. So the powerful men he was playing for, including probably the president, and that Lindsey Graham was playing for when he had his like rage fit, um, <laughs> those powerful guys saw those expressions of anger and understood them to be signs of you know strength and come. I mean, I think they you know it, it got him on the Supreme Court. I mean, they would have done anything to put him on the Supreme Court, but but it matters that a popular vision of him was like. Right. There, there, there was that. There was, there was Matt Damon on Saturday Night Live. <laughs> so right? That matters. It matters that there was a view, that there are other views that have enough, like we're changing the way that we just reflexively understand that nutty display to be serious and deserving of respect. And as long as we're talking about white men, and by the way, nothing personal, gentlemen, whoever's in the <laughs> audience. Um, Rebecca, I asked her to, I, I wrote this down. She tweeted out um, uh, somebody else's, the last lines of somebody else's poem today, which really resonated on a day of, of a state funeral for, you know, pres uh, former presidents are entitled to state funerals. Um, many good things about George, uh, Herbert Walker Bush. But here's this, I wanna read, I wanna read this, the end of this poem and I want Rebecca to talk about it. Uh, it's by a woman named Gail uh, Danley, and the um, poem is called Funeral Like Nixon's. And the end of the poem is, let me break this down for you. You see, I just want to die like a white man, blameless, timeless, ageless. <laughs> I I didn't, not only did I not write that incredible poem, but I didn't even tweet it myself. I knew about it because Saeed Jones at BuzzFeed uh, tweeted it, and I was just like, I think I tweeted, I, th I retweeted him like three times, because I was like, <laughs> that, that, that. Um, it's, I mean, I'd never read the poem before, and it's just incredible, and it speaks to so much. Um, I, I mean, and we see it all the time. We see it all the time. I mean, just thinking about it, and it's funny, a, a colleague wrote what I thought was an absolutely stunning story. I haven't, I haven't read all the Bush coverage, in part because I just can't. Um, <laughs> and in part because I've been very busy. Um, but I read, uh, some of it I have read, and one of my favorite pieces was a piece by um, a colleague and friend named Garance Franco Ruta, who was a young activist in ACT UP, and she wrote about, um, uh, Bush's legacy with AIDS. And it was a very beautiful piece that was very critical. Mm -hmm. And I, I tweeted it, and I got so many people coming back to me about like, don't sp oh, you can't even wait till he's in the ground, don't speak ill of the dead. She actually addresses it in the piece, noting correctly 
you know, yes, there's the argument that we don't, you know, we shouldn't speak ill of the dead, but who's gonna speak for the so many who died because of his inattention to the, to the AIDS crisis, right? There are lots of dead people here. And, um, you know, I just, it is amazing. It is amazing what can get glossed over in some people. I mean, think about the way that a news media covers African-American kids who were shot. You know, what was the, he's no, he was no angel, right? Do you remember who's, yeah. I don't remember whose case that, you know, the, was it Michael Brown? Michael Brown? It was Michael Brown, was no angel, you know? And that somehow, but, but we can't speak ill of a president who waged wars and let people die. Blameless, timeless, ageless. Yeah. It's quite extraordinary. Let me switch subjects a little bit to the issue we were talking before about women showing their anger, uh, crying. Mm. I have long said that I thought women in the workplace ought to be allowed to cry uh, without going to the ladies' room because I think men ought to just figure out that if we cry, we'll get over it and then move on. This is partly what we do sometimes and it doesn't change any, any deals, it's just something there. You have a position on crying also. You talk about crying in the book a bit. Right, well one of the ways that I think because we are always told to tamp down our anger and not yell and not raise our voices and you know not hit a wall, um, many women turn to crying as an outlet um, or just as the expression. I don't think even without, with, with really, I, I was shocked when I published this book. So many women, especially in the first few weeks, told me, oh my God, I didn't even realize that I was so angry when I cry, but it's completely true. Like, I don't even think it's conscious. Um, I have a memory that I write about in the book of being a young, young person in an office and crying out of absolute fury at some injustice that had just happened in the workplace and having an older manager of mine, somebody who I slightly feared, a woman who was sort of just extremely business-like and competent and kind of scary, <laughs> pull me by sort of the scruff of my neck into a stairwell and said, don't ever let them see you crying. They, they don't know you're furious. She said it to me. She said, they don't know you're furious. They think that they've gotten to you and it'll please them. Mm -hmm. um, it is also true that we can't talk about tears and their use. There's a lot of people who've written about crying and why women cry when they're angry. The idea that it, rather than exhibiting a ferocity that will make them unappealing and threatening, crying is far more comfortable because it indicates to a lot of people women who are feeling, who are vulnerable. Right. And that's a much more comfortable frame for femininity for people. It's so much they less want threatening. To, they want to see you crying. <coughs> right, your tears, and this is where they're, uh, your tears, especially if you are a white woman, are greeted with sympathy and warmth. They're, whereas they're, your I'll race, protect you. Where, it's, yes, it is a call to protection, again, of a woman who within a white, white patriarchy is easily identifiable as worthy of protection, and that winds up often being white women. Mm -hmm. The use of white women's tears to garner sympathy it also has a very terrible history. I mean, this is part of the history of, of women, often women within their own abusive marriages to white men, making claims of sexual violence against black men, provoking violence against black men. Like the power of tears for white women is, it goes in a lot of different directions. Mm -hmm. um, but, there is one of the studies that I came across when I was writing this book that absolutely shocked me is that they did a study of women who were accusing their partners of domestic abuse mm -hmm. in courtrooms. Mm -hmm. And if those women showed anger on the witness stand, the accused men got shorter sentences than if they wept. If the women wept and showed themselves as victims who needed protection. Vulnerable. Vulnerable then the accused men got longer sentences. But if they yelled, the men got shorter sentences. So what's the lesson for today? If your, your daughter who is young, uh, 20 years from now comes to you and says, mom, what do I do? I, 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 am I allowed to cry in the workplace or not? Well, part of what I 
came to while writing this book was that while so many of the messages that we get are about expression, right? And so many of the questions I get, maybe there'll be one here, um, are about how do I use my voice? How do I raise my voice? How do I express my anger? How do I protect myself against it? And even though it seems very natural that this book would be prescriptive about how to better express anger, I don't actually have a lot of advice on that front, in part because I think we already have 15 million messages in our heads about when you raise your voice, when you don't raise your voice, blah, 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 blah. And the problem remains that we're in a system that doesn't make room for or respect that anger. And so what needs to change is not us and how we maneuver through that system. It has to be the system that changes. Well, how do you change a system that doesn't value women's anger? You change the way that you yourself listen for hear and receive that anger. We have to start recognizing the patterns around us, the ways in which the angry voices around us are tossed off or ignored or marginalized or you know not and taken do, seriously. And do what with that information? Start listening to those anger. Start treating, start treating the anger of the people around you in your workplace, in your family, in your community, within your political and activist spaces, and I hope that everybody is participating civically at this point, because folks, it's an emergency, um, within the spaces in which you are participating, take the anger that you might initially be like, ugh, not right now, like we can't, or you know, oh, this is gonna be a problem. Start treating it like reporters treat the anger of the white men in the diners, right? Start asking questions. It doesn't mean that everybody who's angry is gonna wind up being persuasive to you about what they're angry about, but start listening differently for the anger around you, especially the anger coming from the most vulnerable people around you, the least represented people around you. Start asking questions about it and then really listening to the answers, including if some of that anger is at you. So don't be put off by the anger. Don't immediately put up a, a barrier. Don't immediately dismiss somebody just because they're angry. Right, that's the first step. And then if that anger is, if, if what you hear from that angry person is persuasive or teaches you something, Take it seriously. Treat it as politically consequential and again, instructive as to something that needs to be fixed. Is there a problem in this workplace or in this you know, activist group? Is there inequity here that needs to be addressed, that needs to be talked about, that we need to, we need to fix a problem that is, that is provoking this anger? Take it seriously, treat it, treat it as consequential and valid. So we need to, we need to start doing uh, to other people around us what we want the, to, them to do yes. about us. Okay, Let, let's, we've got some terrific questions here. Let me go through some of these and then we'll finish up. Um, now this, this comes right off of our uh, previous conversation. What are your thoughts on Ross Douthat's op-ed <laughs> in the New York Times today? Yeah, um, yeah. I didn't read that whole op-ed because I read the first part and I was like, today is too short for this op-ed. <laughs> <laughs> you wanna just... Um, this op-ed, um, it was, uh, it was a, there was a collective we um, that one of the reasons that people are talking the way they're talking about it, George Bush is because we miss the WASP elite leadership. Ruling class was actually the word that he used. <laughs> right, we miss the WASP ruling class. <laughs> Do you feel that you don't need to respond to this question any further? <laughs> Let me, I want to say one thing. There's Please. so many things to be said about that yes. column. And I'm not, I cannot even, so many people have said them very well today. I have read some of the responses and not read the entire column. Sorry, Ross. Um, <laughs> but something that really struck me is the idea that we are not now governed by a WASP <laughs> ruling class, right? Like. Who do you think is our Congress and President and Vice President? I mean, What's we've only about? been governed. <laughs> but I mean, this is, you know, and, and in fact, I actually think it's, it's, it's indicative of a much larger problem, which is this idea that Donald Trump is something that he's not that's perpetuated by a mainstream press. Donald Trump is a rich wasp. He is a rich member of the elite. And, and the notion, this sort of idea that like, that's changed. All gone. <laughs> like, what, 
there have been two presidents in our history who haven't been wasps. Is that right? Uh, well, we have what? We Obama and Kennedy. And Kennedy, Kennedy was the first Catholic, and Obama, yeah. yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Hillary's not president, and I keep forgetting. It's weird. <laughs> but she, well, she's a, keep forgetting. But, but she's a wasp, too. <laughs> Like, even if she is president, she's go. a wasp. There you go. <laughs> uh, speaking of Hillary, um, you are asked for your thoughts about Hillary. I guess I was actually going to ask why you thought Hillary lost, <laughs> even though we know she didn't. That's a separate issue. But um, thoughts? I have so many thoughts about Hillary. I've been writing about Hillary Clinton for a long time. Um, and at, at first, I didn't want to. I'm a, I am a, I'm a left Democrat. Um, I, uh, you know, my first vote was in 1996 for Bill Clinton. Um, he was actually elected the first time I was, I was just not yet 18, I was a senior in high school. Um, I was a sort of um, aggressive Hillary critic in my personal life. I didn't write about politics at the time at all. Um, when she was a senator from New York, I felt that she was a centrist and a compromiser. And in fact, when I, I started writing about feminism in my late 20s and um, was forced by my editor. I, I, you know, when I was writing about feminism when I first started, A, it was very rudimentary feminism. I didn't know a lot about what I was writing about. Um, and it was, a lot of it was pop culture analysis and some stuff about the movement and its history. Um, I was kind of forced to write a big story about Hillary Clinton in 2006 against my will because I didn't want to write. I mean, the story was about why feminists didn't support Hillary Clinton. My first book was about, I covered her 2008 campaign for the presidency. Um, and I went into that campaign as a John Edwards supporter. Mm -hmm. Cheers! <laughs> um, this is by way of saying that everybody can make mistakes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, politically, I would probably do it again. Gosh, I guess, just not personally. Um, maybe, I don't know, I don't know. Um, but I wrote a book about, about the sort of my evolution of thinking around Hillary and issues around, it was about Hillary Clinton, Michelle Obama, and Sarah Palin, and issues around gender, race, and class as they played out in that 2008 election. During the course of that 2008 election, I, I eventually became um, a rather ardent Hillary supporter. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I covered her, but I didn't ever report on her then. She would never, her people would never return a call for me. I was writing at the time for, for Salon. And then in the, during the 2016 election, as a reporter, that also would not get calls returned for a very long time, but eventually um, did and wound up writing a very long profile of her. And, and, um, and I have so many, I've just written about her for so long and I think she's such a fascinating figure and I both am critical of and deeply admire her and I wish she were our president. Do you I, think she should run again? No. Okay. No. No. <laughs> um, I will like hold on to her ankles <laughs> and prevent her <laughs> from running again. I'm not going to make you do that. No, but I, I, I don't think she should run again. One of the things about Hillary that it makes it so complicated to answer any kind of question with any kind of quickness or clarity about her, she has lived a remarkable life in this country, often as being the only. Mm -hmm. And she has so much history baggage. I, I deeply admire her. I was so mad at her 10 days ago with that. The rock tour? Oh, that too. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I wasn't even going to go there. No, the comments about immigration. Yeah. I was livid and I said so. And then I got 100 people on Twitter. You know, usually I get people about how I'm a corporate neoliberal person because I'm perceived as a Hillary lover. And then I got all the Hillary people telling me like, you know, you just hate women because I was critical of Hillary. So um, I am always, I have lived now, you know, a lifetime of being totally torn up about Hillary Clinton and feeling very conflicted about her always. It's complicated. It's, it's a completely it's beyond complicated. complicated. But part of it is that she did, she did have this career where she was often the only one out there in one, in one right. way or another. Right. And one of the things that is getting better about the future is that we're not living in a world where it's onlys. Where I, think, I think this is a huge, 
a huge piece of the puzzle, <coughs> which is, and I think I think the whole the whole thing about anger in your book that that um, um, when we get angry, people have to learn that's not who we are necessarily completely. You're allowed to be angry one minute and not angry the next minute. Yes. You're allowed to be Hillary doing this and Hillary doing that. Yeah. You're allowed to be the first this and not the first that. There's, it's got to, we, we've got to have room for more subtlety and more gray area. This is a structural problem, again, within a white patriarchy. A phrase, by the way, that I would not have been allowed to utter on a stage like five years ago without being laughed out of a room. Um, but when you, when there are only individuals succeeding within a system that's not built for them, those individuals bear the weight of so much expectation and the, and the microscope is always on them and every move they make somehow is, is like everybody projected onto a big screen and so, and it's, it's a totally unjust bar, you know? Like the, the, our government is filled with corrupt, stupid, incompetent, Men who have, you know, white men who have served in capacities and, for and, years and, and, and a few are women celebrated. Too. And, and some women too. We're getting there. But, <laughs> but the, those who are not white, those who are not men, are so rarely permitted that kind of, that level of, not even forgiveness, but invisibility in their ineptitude. Well, we're seeing a lot more of the women in this administration being that way. So there you are. It, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but that is true. That is true. And it's one thing there's, you know, when we talk about progress, Bella Abzug um, said that part of the goal of feminism, and this is important to keep in mind, is not just to have another female Einstein. It's so that a female Schlemiel will be promoted at the same rate as a male Schlemiel. Right. And that's something, there are a lot of arguments within feminism where you say, where you have people saying, oh, if women were in power, everything would be better. Well, perhaps women have certain kinds of negotiating skills at this point, in part because they've been forced to work differently being out of the power structure. But if we actually imagined a world in which power were divided evenly, I see zero evidence to suggest that women are inherently better than men. Right, actually, and that if given, the, if certainly if given the same, there's an incredible novel by Naomi Elderman that you have to read called The Power. If given the kind of power that men have had, I have no doubt that women would be just as, as corrupt and inept. This and is a wonderful quote that I used to use to end all my speeches in the 70s, uh, and it was 70s, 1970s, <laughs> and it was Jane Addams, the wonderful uh, 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 Nobel Peace Prize winner, uh, uh, settlement house worker, fabulous woman from uh, in Chicago, and the quote went, I am not one of those who believes, strictly speaking, that women are better than men. Uh, we have not wrecked railroads. We have not corrupted whatever. I forget the middle part. And then the end of it is, but then you must remember, we must not have the chance. Yes. Uh, we've That's now had great. the chance. And uh, I used to use, I don't use it anymore because there are corrupt women in power, right. certainly, because we've had the chance. And I, right. that's a whole separate discussion we could but have. But it is interesting because I, do, I would like to see some of the femi feminist argument move away from that notion that if they had power, all the institutions would run better, because I don't think it's true. And I think also it's important that we invest in parity and equality for parity and equality's sake, right. for representation's sake. Absolutely right. Uh, speaking of which, not really. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Uh, why does Pelosi get so much grief, but Chuck Schumer gets none? It's probably a one-word answer on this, huh? Penis. I'll take it. Um, question. Did you notice any changes during the midterms with how uh, women candidates, by the way, I can, could I just say women is not an adjective, it's female candidates, just saying. How female candidates. I do, I do women candidates too. But it's not an adjective. I know, I know. <laughs> were able, how the women who were running for office were able to express more productive anger than ever before. Oh yeah. The, this, the historic number of women who ran in 2018, um, 
I mean, there was such a range. It was a really revolutionary year in terms of how women presented themselves on political stages. Um, and it's been changing slowly, right? But because all we could conceive of for a long time was, was the idea of what leadership looked like as being white and male, what you had was several generations of women who not all of them, there, there obviously were outliers, but many of whom tried, like that's the, the helmet hair and the pantsuit, right? And the sort of projection of certain kinds of typically masculine traits. Um, and it's a, it's a model, that, I mean, this is a Margaret Thatcher model too, right? That there were women who could convey things that were sort of familiar within a, Within our understanding of, of what masculine leadership looked like, um, and that was our only that was our only role model. That was the bar we were. That was to hit. what leaders were. Right. Right. And and part of the long term project has been to adjust our eyes and ears to a new model that you know of of leadership that could look a million different ways. Mm -hmm. And that progress has been happening. It's not just about this year, but this year was just this kind of efflorescence of women running in like just talking about their anger, talking about, talking, I mean, not just anger, breastfeeding in their right. ads, um, talking about their experiences so with harassment was, it and was, assault. It was finally, um, <coughs> it was finally a time when they were allowed to do that and they took full advantage of it. Right, well to run sort of as something closer to full human beings. Exactly, and I, could I just say, you didn't mention very kindly, but how many of you remember those horrible bows we had to wear at our neck for about <laughs> six months oh or maybe God. a year? Oh. The worst. Right, that, the ties, all the changed. bows. Yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, how do we counter women's anger being mocked and delegitimized, or do we just not care? It's hard to not care because the, um, it has consequences when it's mocked and delegitimized and punished in many cases. Um, you know, I think it's impossible to say we just don't care. Again, I'd go back to my previous answer, which is that we have to try to not mock it and delegitimize it ourselves. Um, I mean, that's the, we have to change the way it's received. We have to change the way we hear it and, and that we respect change it. Change the way it's received by changing the way we receive it from others. Start that way from others and whether, it, whether it's at us or at other things and yes, start it and, and talk about it with other people, right? Start, don't keep it, you know, and, and tell, if, you, if you're in a place where it is, and, and this I would say is especially true for the men in the audience, for the white men in the audience, for the white women in the audience, for the people who have relative degrees of power within their situations, um, it also means that when you are in a situation where you hear somebody's anger that you are hearing is perhaps valid or worth listening to, being written off, delegitimized, mm -hmm. um, greeted with a kind of punitive energy, if you are in a position where you have authority or power to point that out and to change it, do it, right? Use whatever power you have to be a part of changing the way that we hear this anger. Makes sense. Last question. I am so mad, this person writes, and I gotta believe this is a woman, that I can't even read your book without feeling triggered. Oh. How do you stay sane? How do you keep having the strength to keep going? Uh, that is a great and very generous question. Um, again, I would say that I am in a position of tremendous um, luxury, you know? I'm selling my book. I have a platform. Mm -hmm. I am encouraged and paid to say the things that I say. And in this, I think, you know, look, I'm tired, my voice is shot. Um, this, this tour and talking to people, as I hope I'll talk to some of you, um, after this in signing lines has been educational and um, very intense and very emotional. Um, and I have so much to process. I feel like I, I wish, I have a day job that I have to go back to really soon. Um, but I sort of wish I could take three weeks and, and process so much of what I've heard and what I've learned. And so like, yeah, it's hard. I could, I could use like several nights good sleep in a row. <laughs> Dream on. Right, <laughs> but A, I'm in a, like, I'm, again, this is my job, I'm being paid for it. 
um, I'm being taken more than anything, more than the money or the work that I'm doing. It's that what I'm saying is being taken seriously by somebody, whether it's you in the audience or whether it's a reviewer or whether it's my editor. Like that is something that most people don't get. That's the whole problem is that anger isn't taken seriously. And in fact, that's part of what my job is with this book and out here is to say to you, like I'm taking your anger seriously. Because, and that's the thing that people have said to me over and over again, like, and why you're so mad you can't open the book because it's triggering. If, if there were somebody or a community or a network, and I encourage you to find spaces and participation, whether it's in electoral politics or in protest politics, um, where you can channel, your, not only put your anger to use, but find other people who are angry about the same things that you are, because I can't tell you the value of networks and having people to talk to and to support you and to spell you when you're exhausted and who you then in turn spell when they're exhausted. Because the, the second part of this question is, and something that's crucial, is, and especially crucial for a lot of people who have only recently become this angry, is that this anger cannot should not fade when, God willing, this president is gone. It is not about him. The anger at him for a lot of people has opened up a door to all kinds of inequities that we all should have been angry about long before. And those inequities are going to persist long after Trump is gone. And this is, this will be the rest of our lives. I cite Emma Gonzalez, um, in the book saying the young woman from um, Parkland the, the school in Florida she says um, she has said I'll do this for the rest of my life I may have to fight this fight for the rest of my life and that is um, I think that's something that we all of us who want to be engaged in that fight have to come to terms with and I actually don't find it deadening it's one of the things that's the most inspiring to me because and I write a lot about the history in this book, and the history is stuff that I've, and we didn't talk about it much tonight, but like I've gone back and had to teach myself a lot of history that I wasn't taught in school. But in learning that history, what I have learned about is centuries, generations of people who have given their entire lives to these fights and often didn't live to see the victories. But it was because they were willing to fight for their entire lives and to be, you know, exhausted and, and disheartened and, and often traumatized and often face enormous defeats and setbacks and frustrations, but because they were willing to keep on doing and keep on letting their anger lead them toward a fight for a better world, they did give their lives and their energy and their time and their days to that fight. And because they did, those victories in many cases did happen. And so I see the reckoning with the fact that this should and will and must be the rest of our lives um, as an opportunity um, to join a fight that preceded us um, and that was righteous and proud and, and that it is our responsibility and our honor to participate in and, for the rest of our lives. And let me leave you uh, with one quote that should, if you're not already there, get you to stop in the lobby, buy the book, talk to um, Rebecca, uh, because this is a very important book and her timing is extraordinary. Being mad, she writes, is correct. Being mad is American. Being mad can be joyful and productive and connective. Don't ever let them talk you out of being mad again. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.